Oh, we clever. Look, we can fake it the first time. Now we can do it again. Oh, we can do it better this time. That's what Hasselblad said when they were asked to build a camera. Yeah, we can do that and we can do it better. They could fake it right down to make the 11 o'clock news. Oh, you've got to time it right. Of course you've got to time it right, because that's when all the sponsors are watching. <laughs> yeah. Oh, dear. It, it's a bit sad, really. It's a bit sad. There are less people now, except for the more diehard members, there are less people now who are questioning what we're saying. I notice that a lot of people are now sort of saying, yeah, watch what you've done on your Apollo Detective series. I tend to agree with it. I think you're exposing it. I think you've got a good point to make. Nobody's arguing against the vacuum problems. Nobody's arguing against the radiation problems, which we know exist. Even NASA admit that they exist. So how did they solve it the first time? They won't tell us. It's national security. You can't release the information. That's the problem. Radiation is a natural event in space. How can that be a national security issue? Only if you faked it. Then it's a national security issue. Not if it's for real. So come on, let's get honest about this. Let's get honest about Apollo, which never happened. It was a brilliantly executed propaganda exercise to demonstrate to the world American technological superiority. And they did it brilliantly. I'm going to start calling it German because the Americans really weren't involved. They had to bring all those people in that paperclip. They brought all the brilliant minds in to do the best they could. And then it still had to fake it. The Americans did not have the technology. They don't have the technology today. Nobody yeah. does. That's one admission that they have to concede to is the fact that they had to bring in German engineers and scientists. Yeah. And it was their rocket that was the first one to launch, the Redstone, because the previous one was it Vanguard. I think it was the American rocket blew up. And if they'd used the Redstone rocket, which was developed by von Braun and his German mates over in Alabama, if they'd used that, they'd have got a satellite up before Soviet Union did. So they sabotaged themselves by insisting on using American rockets, which didn't work. It's a bit sad, really. It really is a bit sad. But I think we're beyond that now. I think we can forgive them for their efforts. They were only trying to do the best for their country, which is fine. That's not a problem. But when you fail to do something that you said you did, and people have called you out on it, you have to hold your hands up and say, OK, caught me. This is what actually happened. Now, if they say that, they say, yeah, it was faked. Uh, we had to do it. And these are the reasons why. These are the national security issues. That's fair enough. I think people will understand that, given the times that they were in, the late 1960s. There's a lot going on then, which is probably similar to what's going on now, but it's different. We'd probably say, OK, we understand why you did it. We understand that you didn't have the technology available to land on the moon. If you do now, let's see you do it, but do it for real. If you have problems doing it, ask and we'll probably be helped. There are a lot of people out there who want to see it happen for real. And if you have problems doing it, which we understand can exist, then we will help you. Wouldn't it be nice to sit down and get the truth? Yes. On what the advancements, how far we are along in our satellite technology and other space programs, wouldn't it be nice to get the actual truth? They so would. We know exactly where we are. I mean, I understand the rest of the imagination to reality programs that are going on out there and fiction books and everything else. That's all one thing. But don't mix all that stuff in what is actually real. No, do it for real. Do it in public. Mm -hmm. Ask for help when you need help. If we're not going to put man in space, we're going to develop our AI robots are be going to be the ones that are going to eventually get anywhere. Then we should know about it. That would be truthful because I think that is the route that will eventually take place. But let's see this technology. If you need this many refueling rockets <laughs> to go anywhere. That means we haven't been anywhere beyond yep. low Earth orbit. And when I talk low Earth orbit, I'm talking under 100 miles. Exactly. It's a good point. Because at least you have less vacuum to deal with. You don't have to deal with the cold welding if you stay under that 130 mile range. You don't cross that 10 to the minus 6. You stay down 75, 80 miles, you can successfully orbit a vehicle 
and the hull structure is a lot lighter, all kinds of stuff. You're much lower down. You don't have as much difficulty with radiation. You still don't have the protection of the atmosphere. You do have quite a bit more, but you can protect yourself against it. You're close enough that you can communicate. All of those things fall into there because as soon as you get into the ionosphere, there's interruption, which yep. is demonstrated. All of that makes sense to me. If you came down and said, this is the reality, this is where we're working in. This is our speed. This is the reentry, and this is the amount of heat that we're taking, and this is how much the heat shields are working with. Then it all starts to make sense. As soon as you come out and say, hey, we're coming in at 25,000 miles an hour, no. We don't have anything. We're, no. You're creating plasma. When you create plasma, it's just dissolving in front of your face. I mean, it's just evaporating <laughs> right off of there, right? I mean, it's incredibly dangerous when you get something that's coming in at that speed. And we've had a couple of space shuttles that uh, have demonstrated that problem. Yeah. One tiny heat shield and boom, things gone. That's just re-entry on NASA's documented speed of re-entering the atmosphere from low Earth orbit. Coming in from the moon is, you know, it's five, six, eight times the temperature. Yep, and yet NASA claimed that the Apollo craft had a direct entry when they re-entered the Earth's atmosphere, direct entry. And they had to burn off all that heat with a heat shield, which is subsequently demonstrated to have been a bit less protection than was expected. It is sad. If NASA claim that it's a direct entry they use for Apollo, they've never demonstrated it again, and they've demonstrated the problems that even space shuttles have re-entering at much slower speed. Re-entry from Earth orbit is 17,500 to 18,000 miles an hour. Re-entry from lunar orbit is 25,000 miles an hour, 50% higher. 50% higher speed is twice the heat, inverse square law. So you, you've got to have a far more impressive heat shield coming back from the moon than you do from low Earth orbit. And they haven't got it. They haven't demonstrated it. The only time the Orion spacecraft has returned from space back in December 2014, nearly 10 years ago, they tested it, and the heat shield nearly failed. And that wasn't coming back at lunar orbit return speed. That's still well below that. Yeah, it's about 80% of lunar orbit return speed. And it nearly failed. They haven't done it since. They haven't tried it since. Well, whatever happened during that test, they sure shut down a lot of their programs at that point. I mean, they put 140 sensors on that machine. The cameras failed going 500 miles out. And I would assume that they lost communication at that point because when you look at some of the other documentation, looking at trying to communicate through that area, below the Van Allen Bells, 500 to 800 miles out there, they're having problems with communications and nobody wishes to address it. And all you get is, is straight denial. Yeah. So you've got these guys that say, oh, I got an amateur radio and I can listen to anything from anywhere. Different wavelengths. And my thing to them is, is you better get down to these radio stations and show them how to do it with one watt of power. They're using 50,000 watts for a hundred mile radius. Yeah. You could save the hydro bill, you know, they could pay you quite substantially this, the amount of savings they would have on equipment and everything else because they have to have these huge towers up and repeaters and boosters and everything else to make sure they got a signal. They might be mistaken the fact that they're just bouncing their signal off the atmosphere when they get a long range. Yeah, they probably are. Like a shortwave radio bounces along. I mean, you, you pick it up in different atmospheric conditions, but it's not consistent. When you start looking at all of these things that they claimed, and now all of them today are a problem. There are a lot of problems out there. And I still can't figure out why, if they can put all that fuel up and they have all that technology, why they just don't turn the rocket around, slow it down and let it just drop in gently. Exactly. I mean, Musk can land his rockets now. Well, the first stage can be landed back on Earth. Well, here's something. If you put a flight path out, they claim, oh, we go to the moon, you go into orbit. They figured out how to get it down to 6,000 miles an hour to get into the lunar orbit. They're not landing, just into orbit. Why not come back, go into Earth's orbit, and if you need some fuel, send one of these fancy machines up there, refuel the thing, so then you can slow it down. Or they do this whiplash technology to speed it up. Why don't they just reverse that to help slow it down in Earth's orbit? 
they could gradually bring it down into a little bit of atmosphere to help it slow down without coming right in. Once you're in a stable orbit, you would have more control over the machine. But no, they don't have that. It's just like, okay, these things are just, there's Earth's gravity, and it's just getting sucked right in like a meteor. No control over it. But there's all of these things, and I mean, they have all of these engineers. They must have thought all this stuff through. Go back and you read the documents. As soon as they're coming into Earth's atmosphere in any way, shape, or form, they dump all the fuel. They empty all the tanks out. Why? Because of that heat of re-entry. Even the oxygen tanks are emptied out. They're coming in with just the air inside the capsule. There's no reserve. They got lots of time. It's a big enough capsule that they could sit there and breathe the air, but you can't leave them for five or six hours in there without opening the door. True. It's a good question to ask, that one. Yeah. You can go into orbit around the moon. Gravity is much less, one-sixth of that of Earth. But you're still going quite fast to maintain an orbit around the moon, 6,000 miles an hour. That's quite fast because you have to speed your craft up. If you come from Earth, you achieve escape velocity, which is 25,000 miles an hour. And once you've achieved that speed, you then shut the engines off and it just cruises all the way to the moon. You're not using a rocket to get to the moon. You're using lunar gravity when you get to the neutral point. It's about 20,000 miles out from the lunar orbit. But before that, you're slowing down all the way from escape velocity of 25,000 miles an hour to about 2,000 miles an hour when you get to the neutral point. Then you speed up as the lunar gravity takes over. In reverse, you do the same thing. So you just get enough just to get past the lunar gravity and let the Earth speed you up. You're going to be coming in a hell of a lot faster, but then get into orbit. Yeah. And you can slow down into Earth orbit using the same techniques you got into lunar orbit. It really isn't difficult. Just because Earth orbit is at faster than it was at lunar orbit, obviously because the gravity is different, you can get into Earth orbit and slow down, or you would be slowed down by the point you get into Earth orbit. You're then doing 18,000 miles an hour, which is a much more manageable speed. And you can drop below that. I mean, all you have to do is turn it around if you got some fuel and just and get yourself down to a thousand miles an hour and just let it free fall in. Free falling from a thousand miles an hour isn't a problem. Neil had the wingtips on fire with the X-15. He was a brave pilot, that Neil Armstrong. That's exactly what he was. He was a pilot. Yeah, he was a pilot. Nobody piloted a Saturn V rocket. Here's something people don't understand. They're sitting inside the payload of a Saturn V rocket. They're in the command module inside the Saturn V rocket. All of those controls that they're looking at in there is for the command module yep. itself. It has nothing to do with the Saturn V rocket. None of those controls in there are operating a Saturn V rocket. That thing is nothing more than a bullet and you spit out the end of it when it gets to wherever it's going. People don't understand that. So when they have astronauts that were pilots, is because they could understand a little bit more about the pressure differentials that they're dealing with and the G-forces. But they're not flying. Nobody flew a Saturn V rocket. There isn't even a control panel for it on the machine. All of that stuff was done, so-called, by computers. The first and second stage separate by pressure differentials when you run out of fuel. It triggers the next one. And the only thing that's stopping it from going out of control were the mechanical gyros that were on board. Yeah, it was all pretty basic stuff, getting that rocket into low Earth orbit. But that stuff was done in the 1940s. Yeah, with slide rules. (laughs) Well, if you're sitting in England, you had buzz bombs coming in. Yeah, you did. Several hundred of them. They're being guided by the same mechanical means without any computer assistance. They simply adjusted the weight of the distance that they're flying and they put a little more fuel in or they flew a little higher, a little lower. And wherever that one landed, they just made that adjustment. They used their slide roll and say, oh, yeah, well, let's put an extra two gallons in there and it'll go this much further. And that's how they did it. That's the difference between a rocket and a missile. A rocket is an unguided projectile. It has no means of locating its target. A missile has the ability to direct itself because one of the things that was done when the V-2s were being launched from Holland 
was they could work out the trajectory that the rocket was going to take from the people who observed it launch. And they then had enough time to radio back to the UK to get the bombers to come out and obliterate the launch site, which is why the V2s were mobile. And they didn't leave great craters in the ground because they had deflector shields underneath them, which a few people don't know about. But you could work out the trajectory of the rocket and go backwards along it to find out where it was launched from. And you could then send bombers in to obliterate anything that was still there, like the vehicles used to launch it. Maybe that's what Apollo was using. They put deflector shields down on the lunar surface so there's no blast crater. But how did they get the deflector shields there to begin with, I ask myself. They must have been there because they left that garbage bag there. Yeah, they did. Every time they seem to land on top of a garbage bag, there's absolutely no way you can see a video of that going out the door. There isn't a mark on the lunar surface of it being there. And Neil didn't carry it down. And he didn't kick it out. The documents claim that he kicked it underneath the machine. Well, there's no evidence of that because the video camera's on and it never came out the door. Never it had came to out. be there in the first place. The set dressers had a few things left over, shoved them in the bag and forgot about it. Exactly. After they got it set up, they would have to regroom all that stuff. And the What's next probably time. in that bag are probably beer cans and pizza boxes. Yeah, because you can get good pizzas at Clovis, I believe. Well, I found the beer can. You remember that? Oh, yeah, there's a beer can. Yep. Somebody left it out there. Oh, dear, oh, dear. Apollo is a bit of a disaster area now. I think the Smarter Everyday video, well, he brings to the attention of people who should know about it, what they should be doing, and they don't know. They're they're trapped in this narrative that they've created. It doesn't work. When he's presenting himself to today's scientists and engineers on there, and he's saying, we can't do this. And then he refers to, oh, Apollo did it this way. And in that video, they're showing a little plastic model of the lander and stuff like that. I think it's hilarious, right? And by the way, he also stated that Starship hasn't even managed to reach low Earth orbit, not even close. Well, we made a comment on that launch and I said, it's taken seven seconds to even start to move. Yeah, but he recognizes that, and so does Phil Mason. They're looking back and forth at it, and they can't put two and two together and see that there's something wrong. That's what gets me. Have you noticed the similarity between Starship and the Soviet N-1 rocket with a similar number of engines? They had four launches of the N-1, all of which ended in disaster. They exploded. They're very similar-looking machines when it comes down to that. It's like Musk and SpaceX have looked at the Soviet space program, because we're always told that it was ahead of America's early on, which it was, and have copied it without realizing the problems. Don't forget, though, Musk initially was getting his rockets from Russia. It wasn't until 2019 that he decided he's going to develop his own. And of course, NASA were buying rocket engines from Russian Federation, as they are now, I think it was 60 at the last guess. You know, in Russia, you can just go to a dollar store and get them. A ruble store. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, you can find because they make very good rocket engines. They're very reliable. Let's take a look at this. It says, Starship spacecraft, the engines together produce 3,300,000 pounds of thrust. Now let's look at the article below. As those engines lift Starship off the launch pad, they will generate 16 million pounds of thrust at full throttle. Which is it, guys? Is it 3,300 or is it 16 million at full throttle? And during his presentation, he says that they're producing three times the amount of a Saturn V rocket, which is seven and a half times three. So there's all kinds of numbers on that. And then to get to that weight, all of a sudden they have to have the solid rocket boosters on the side of it to get that kind of stuff. Like the SLS can go 7.8 million pounds instead of 7.5, but only because of the solid boosters. Well, it says the flight in November 2022 holds the current record for the maximum thrust of a rocket, 8.8 million pounds. But then this article up here, it says 3,300,000 pounds of thrust. So again, which is it? Exactly. 
Well, this is why people get so confused. They get confused because the disinformation is being put out there daily. And it's the same thing. We don't know how to fix this yet. We're doing it all the time. We haven't made a spacesuit yet, but we're doing spacewalks. We test them underwater, but not in the real environment of space. Well, quite a few of the comments under the film where you showed that were a bit skeptical about using underwater facilities to duplicate the vacuum of space. It's not the same, it has different effects. So I think people are beginning to see that some of the ways in which NASA claim to train their astronauts is just back to front. You train them in a vacuum chamber. You've got one, it's got the Glenn Research Center, it's the Sandusky Center. You've got one, use it. But they don't seem to do that. The day they use that chamber and put people in there and pull it down to a vacuum test, then I can honestly say that the suits that they're wearing are good for 130 miles off the surface of the Earth. That's all that chamber can pull. But if they put a spacesuit in there, especially from the Apollo era, it's going to explode, and that's going to be the end of it. It wouldn't explode. The air is coming out of the zippers, leaking out so fast it wouldn't even pressurize. If they can do it in that chamber and show that it can handle the equivalent of 130 miles off the surface, that would be good to say that this suit is safe at under 100 miles because you have to have that safety factor. That's what I see, but they don't do that. So how do you do these spacewalks? Can you imagine people wasting money on doing a replica of regolith underwater? I mean, we did that. <laughs> <laughs> and they're, they're making mock-ups and golf balls yeah. in there. Are they just making a joke of themselves? They're just, not trying to honor yeah. Apollo. Well, no, the golf ball honored Apollo, because we all know about the golf shot. That's if you look at it one way. Another way, it's just making a joke of Apollo. Yeah, that's more like it. And I think Smarter Every Day is coming to that point where he's coming out and saying, I'm going to get past this. He's an intelligent man. He's smart enough to see it. He probably has seen it. He put two and two together and come up with the answer. Well, he probably realizes that NASA has not perfected keeping a wet flag in the vacuum of space. And well, when he sees the wet flag, he knows they haven't perfected that yet. Remember when the guy said, I called up NASA and they told me the flag wasn't wet, it was only damp? <laughs> oh, yeah. the guy said he contacted NASA about the wet flag. NASA responded and said, it's not really wet, it's just a little moist. Yeah, because there was a heavy dew in Arizona that morning. <laughs> yeah, well, Flagstaff gets a heavy dew. Yeah. They, they get yeah. fogged in sometimes. And the thing is, it's not intentional, but it is their national symbol. And they think we're disrespecting it. And that's why they want to attack us. And that's why we have idiots that think we're doing that. We're simply trying to get to the truth. And we don't care about your national symbol yeah dear idea did you see the suggestion i forget where it was somebody mentioned that there was a south korean capsule orbiting the moon south korea's got a satellite up to the moon it was photographed by the lunar reconnaissance orbiter they were flying in opposite direction it appears as a street hang on i haven't seen south korea launch a satellite to the moon haven't heard about that haven't read about it what's going on most likely in the near future we may probably have considering our advancements in technology the ability to uncover all the bullshit that has been going on <laughs> yes trouble is they haven't trained ai to do that yet ai just parrots what somebody else has written but then you look at elon musk he's saying one thing with these engines and yet there's no evidence for it. Again, he can't even get this thing that's supposed to have 8.8 .8 million pounds of thrust, this so-called starship, can't even get the thing even near low Earth orbit without something happening. Well, he wants uh, to lift 50 tons of payload, then 100, then 150, and then the biggest one's going to be 200 pounds of payload, and the damn thing can't get off the ground without any payload. It's going to need an aerial refueling before it reaches low Earth orbit at least twice. Oh, that'll be a huge problem. Yeah, I wonder how they're going to pull that one off.
Why don't they have a hose connected to the rocket, let the rocket burn everything off that's in the tanks on the ground, and then when it starts to lift off, switch it to the fuel that's inside of it, and then that way that they won't have to use that much fuel, or can they do that? Well, like what I want to know is, is what is the price of a good Caribbean lobster going to be when he keeps throwing all these rocket parts in the bloody thing all the time? There are people complaining about the amount of pollution that he's putting in there that's not being cleaned up. Like, you say, oh, it's over the ocean. We don't need to clean that part up. 30 engines per ship is at the bottom of the ocean and counting. Plus all the other parts that blew up. How many have blown up that are over top of the water? They don't clean it up. Like I said, what's the price of a good Caribbean lobster? There won't be any left. This keeps going. I'm really surprised he's not receiving a bill for all of that environmental damage that he's causing because think about it. Look at the size of those engines. They're at the bottom of the ocean. They're not going to be reclaiming those engines. How deep is it there? Not very deep. deep. And yet they still won't go and retrieve them. No. That part is fairly shallow along there. That's why they got the oil rigs out there, because it's not that far down. He's got a team of environmental lawyers out there, a team against the environmental lawyers, I guarantee you. The only person I know who's recovered any of the rockets is Bezos. And I came across that picture with the scuba diver over top of it again. <laughs> Laying on the bottom, and I flipped across, I flipped back on the page, And I couldn't find it because I wanted to grab it. A pair of F-1 rockets sitting on the bottom. And Robert has seen it too with a scuba diver over top of it. Yep. And they're supposed to be three and a half miles down. A little farther down to the Titanic. And we all know what happened to that. And you've got a scuba diver in shorts right over top of it in the picture. When I find it the next time, I'm going to grab it so we have it. Yeah. So scuba divers don't really go down very far, do they? Not 3,300 meters. Three and a half miles. Three and a half miles and there's scuba divers out there. That's a real good one, isn't it? <laughs> Maybe they'll find the Apollo 13 rocket. Well, don't forget, Thailand's got pearl divers that dive that deep. We've seen it in movies. Yeah, the pearl divers hold their breath. There's so many things that are wrong that we've identified. It's not difficult to identify what's wrong, but nobody says, okay, yeah, you found it, you spotted it, yeah, we got it wrong. They don't do that because the narrative says we went to the moon and we landed 12 astronauts on the lunar surface. Anybody who denies that must be either a lunatic, uh, lunatic, get it, or just anti-American or whatever. No, what we want is the truth, the honest truth of what's happening. And there are more and more people now looking at this, hearing what we're saying, agreeing that we may have a few points to make. I think they agree that. It's that old RAF phrase, the bombers during World War II. Attacks get heaviest when you're over the target. (laughs) So we're over the target, guys. We're close. We're getting closer. I think if you have people like Smarter every day with the number of subscribers he has to the channel, he's going to move the needle a little bit. So it comes into mainstream discussion. They're going to look like he does the comparison. Apollo did this. But then all of a sudden they're going to wake up and say, well, how the hell did Apollo do it if you can't do it? They're going to start asking those questions. He's brought it forward and he's got a big enough audience. They're going to have to come to our channel and see some of the evidence to really solidify what we're talking about. Yeah, because Smarter Every Day is actually being quite smart. He's not saying that Apollo didn't happen. He's saying we're trying to recreate it. And what are we doing? We're not doing it right. Come on, guys. He's talking to the people who are doing it. I think it was quite brave of him. He said he did not want to ruin the relationship he has with NASA. But what he's talking about is the real problems that are happening today and how much it would take to actually perform such a task. And when you're talking 15, 18 plus or 20 plus, depending on how you look at how they design this trip, launches with machines that are three times the power of a Saturn V rocket. Don't forget, his machines have more power than the Saturn V rocket, and it's still going to take, what, 18 of them? (laughs) Yes, that's the problem. How come those two people can't see it? Why can't Phil Mason and Jason see this? Why can't they see it? It's just not the 18 rockets. These have three times the power. 
So they should have three times the payload, but they don't. It's not part of the narrative. It's not part of what they have been led to believe happened. They can't deny it. And most of that is in fuel because fuel is still and always will be the biggest penalty. Liquid fuel is going to be the biggest penalty to get something off the surface.